All right, uh, we're gonna get this thing going. So good, good evening, everyone. Welcome to October 27, 2020 City Council meeting. In attendance tonight, we have in no particular order, Councilor Pett, Councilor LeBlanc, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Gilman, Councilor Memhard, Councilor Holmgren, and Councilor O'Hara. We also have our uh, mayor, uh, Mayor Taken. We have our um, public health director, Karen Carroll. We have our uh, acting CAO, uh, Vanessa, and we have our fire chief, Eric Smith, and we have our, um, let's see here, our city, Kenny, Kenny, well, I forget what Kenny does, but Kenny, Kenny. Auditor, city auditor, auditor and Jill. Auditor, <laughs> I know. I was talking to him today too, so I, I apologize. All right, so and we have, um, we have a, we have a quite a, and we have our community development director, Jill Cahill. All right. Uh, this meeting is being recorded by video and audio in accordance with the state open meeting law. Consistence with the governor's orders, uh, suspending certain provisions under the open meeting law and banning gatherings of more than 25 people. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation. Additionally, all votes taken by the city council during and uh, during this and future remote meetings will be held by roll call vote. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or device, there is a raise hand button that you can press or tap to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to be, or public hearing to be recognized to speak. Uh, we have announced the city councils. Madam Clerk, can we have the first order of business, please? First order of business is oral communications. All righty, we have four people in attendance uh, besides the 14 people on the panel. So the public shall have every opportunity at every regular scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communications shall be allowed any resident who requests or, or, comp or complaint, who has a request or a complaint or any nature relative to city business to appear before the council. State their problem without debate and the matter shall be referred to the proper agency through the office of the mayor. The resident will be notified within two weeks prior to relative to disposition of same and a copy shall be forwarded to the city council. Person speaking under oral communication shall be limited to three minutes each, and the council president shall not allow complaints as to individual performances. All right, so do we have anybody that would like to speak under oral communications? We have four people in attendance, and if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand or press star nine. All right, seeing none, Madam Clerk, can we have the next order of business, please? The next order of business is the presentation from Karen Carroll, Public Health Director, regarding an update on COVID-19 and other related matters. All right, welcome, Carol. How are you? Good. Thank you, City Councilors, for having me, and Chairman LeBlanc, uh, Mayor. I'll go through a quick update um, on kind of where we've come and what's happened in the last couple of weeks, because there's been quite a bit of activity, and I'm sure you all have some questions. Um, and then, you know, I can answer any questions that you have at that point. Um, basically, through the summer months since I last saw you, we, we've had a pretty smooth ride here in Gloucester. We've had very low case numbers, uh, very little transmission. Our wastewater analysis, the virus levels also reflected that. We kind of bounced right around the level of detection, little above, little below. Uh, for a couple of months, our positivity rate was well below 1%, well below the state average. So again, that's our test positivity rate. Um, our incidence, our number of new cases per 14 days, um, average for over 14 days, that was also low for several months as well. Um, we worked closely with our schools this fall to get the schools open. They've done a tremendous job of having a lot of things in place to support students, staff uh, with questions, concerns, and then safely moving about the building. So um, they are now open and can tell you all about that work. But we, we do work really closely pretty much every day with our schools, our school nurses, um, and communicating, sharing information, um, and doing any tracing that needs to be done as well. So having said all that, around Columbus Day, we did have, uh, we started to see an uptick over that long weekend. Um, we started hearing and seeing some positives. Um, and on the Sunday of that weekend, we had 17 positives come in on one day, which was 
I think a record for us for the whole um, time we've been dealing with COVID. So obviously there was a lot of concern um, and a lot of sort of trying to figure out what was going on really quickly. Um, fortunately, the mayor's office acted very quickly and requested support from the Baker Polito administration in the form of some uh, testing. Some low barrier testing is what we call it. So it's free. Um, you're not asked for a lot of identification. You're not asked for money. You're not asked for insurance. Uh, it doesn't matter where you work, where you live. And the idea is to encourage people um, symptomatic, well, mostly asymptomatic to come, to get tested, to find out what's going on in our community. Um, so at the peak of this outbreak, we had about 79 active cases in the community. And about 20 of those were from our first round of testing. Um, there were no hospitalizations from this uptick, this recent uptick. There were no new deaths in the city. And there were no cases or staff within our long-term care facilities or our senior housing. These obviously are our two high risk areas um, that we watch really closely every day. So unlike in the spring, these particular spike in activity was mainly to do with younger working people um, and not, to, not reaching our elderly population who was at highest risk. Um, we also had no 911 calls for COVID-related symptoms during this time. So all good signs. Um, the tracing team was able to immediately start contacting and tracing all those involved in the outbreak. Um, and we had very good compliance with testing, quarantining, isolating. Um, we had to require the assistance of the Department of Public Health for some of our contact tracing. For one day, we exceeded our own capacity, uh, but we thought that was a good drill, a good chance to try the contact tracing team in um, for that the state offers, and they did a pretty good job. So um, that was good to know that resource is there for us should we need it. Um, we were able to access things in the language we needed it, in translators, maybe not as quickly as we would have liked it, but we were able to get translation services for everything we needed. Um, after the first couple of days of the free testing, we tested approximately 600 people a day. So it was a record for Fallon Ambulance. They did an amazing job. Um, Carol McMahon, our assistant emergency manager, as well as Joe Aiello, the city's emergency manager, partnered with all of the public safety team and very quickly uh, police and everyone else pulled this thing together. And there were a million details as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so again, a remarkable team in place here in the city under the direction of the mayor, the team mobilized and we were able to set up these rapid testing site, not rapid, but um, community-wide testing very, very quickly and put through over 600 people a day. So after the first two days of testing, we were given all of the results. We analyzed those results and saw that about 96% of the participants that came to the testing site were from Gloucester. So that was great for us because we were really getting a handle on um, our population. Um, we're, we're happy to have people from other communities come to the test site. Um, but within our Gloucester population that was tested, we again saw a little below a 2% positivity rate. So this to us was encouraging that we were not seeing a huge number or percentage of positive cases in the community that were accessing the testing. Um, again, we began to see at the same time, within a week, the number of cases per day were coming down. So again, another good sign. Um, and just so you know, you know, I don't, you, you guys are up at this level. I don't know if you know how it works, but our contact tracing team is available seven days a week. And we are watching those numbers, you know, sometimes hour by hour. Um, and we're really making sure that the trend continues to move in the right direction. And if not, what more can we do? What else can we put in place? So the trend continued to move in the right direction for the following two weeks. We've seen a steady decline in new cases. Um, and at this point, we've cleared many of the original 79 from isolation or quarantine. They've completed their time and been released. And we have 32 active 
folks left out of that um, spike. So again, another good sign. Um, we continue to monitor the wastewater through this. We get a once a week report of our virus level in the wastewater here in town. And again, that roughly reflected the increase we saw was about a six or seven fold increase in the wastewater virus level, um, which pretty much mirrored a six fold increase in case numbers. So, and then last week, as our cases started to climb, so did our wastewater. And again, these graphs are all on our city website. So you can kind of follow that trend. Um, the wastewater, again, just reassures us that the asymptomatic population, the other 28,000 people or 20,000 people who are on our city wastewater, who did not attend the test site or go for a test, um, are not showing any, you know, huge levels or spikes in the virus level in the community. So it's kind of our only tool to measure the entire population of asymptomatic folks. Um, and it gives us a quick snapshot in a relatively quick um, and inexpensive way of what's happening in the community. So again, our wastewater uh, testing has proven to be a kind of another piece of the story that's reiterating what we're seeing in real time um, with our cases, which is great. Um, I mentioned that we're seeing predominantly this time around a younger population, the sort of 30 to 40 age group is where our cases are spiking. That also mirrors what's happening statewide. Um, and obviously it's a good thing for our most vulnerable population. It's not such a good thing for containing because there's a lot of movement. People that age work, they go to school, they have children, families, um, so there's a lot of spread that can happen quickly within our communities. So we have um, reestablished the business liaison position. That's a nurse from our contact tracing team. Her name is Ka uh, Callie Til Tilbert, Tibbert. Um, and Callie's going to work in conjunction with our inspection team, so predominantly our food inspector, and going to be available to assist businesses in troubleshooting if they have an exposure, if they have a concern. Um, or if they just need help figuring out how to keep their business safe, how to separate their staff or their patrons, um, anything we can do to provide support to them. So tomorrow morning, thanks to Jill's team, um, we've organized a call with all of our, many of our businesses in town, mainly food establishments, to go over with them um, some of this new information, what the requirements are. We have some more tools, some one-page checklists, uh, and things, materials translated into lots of languages to assist them so that they can continue to operate safely um, through all of this. Um, and in terms of the incident rates, so I'll talk a little bit about the colored map because I think that's something that a lot of you probably hear about. It's the thing that makes the news. Um, it's one indicator and it's an important indicator. It's the number of new cases over a two week period averaged, um, but it's not the only part of the story. It's just showing us these new cases. It's not showing us our total prevalence um, and it's not showing us anything about where these cases are, how sick people are, how much it affects our schools, our um, nursing homes, long-term care facilities. So we really like to look at that as one piece of data. We did go into the red, which means we went above that eight per 100,000 people, eight new cases on average each day over a two week period per 100,000 people. Um, and we anticipate we will still be in the red this week as well. Hopefully, if we have another good week like we've had this week, we may come back into the yellow by next week, which would be our third week. Um, and that would be great. But again, you know, as long as our trends are continuing in the right direction, we are optimistic. Um, and I know many people got an alert that many residents of from Gloucester got a, a robocall or a reverse 911 or something yesterday talking about Gloucester being in the red. And that was probably sounded alarming to people wondering, is this a new uptick or is this a new situation? Um, again, it's because of what happened two or three weeks ago and those higher numbers moved us into the red. 
Um, the, the map that comes out on a Thursday with whatever color you're in is really reflecting sort of two and a half weeks prior. It's the Saturday to Sunday period prior to the Wednesday to run it. Um, so you're kind of, it's a kind of delayed response, if you like. Um, it still means we're, we had an uptick. It still means we need to be really, really careful. Um, it still means we don't want to stay in red. We want to move back to where there's less cases in our community, less new cases. And we're optimistic that is happening right now. But we're also realistic that things can change very, very quickly with, um, you know, one small outbreak can become a big outbreak. Um, again, most of the transmission that we are seeing is within households, and that is also being mirrored statewide. Um, household transmission has become the largest source of clusters, and for obvious reasons, it's very, very difficult when someone in your house has an infectious disease to not get it. So our nurse team is doing a tremendous job working with our families about how they can safely isolate and safely quarantine. Those are two different things. So isolation is when you are actively sick, an index case with COVID. Quarantine is when you've been identified as a contact. And it's really important those people stay away in their homes for 14 days. Um, there's been a lot of confusion, and I think probably because of the travel order, which says that if you come back into Massachusetts, you can get a negative test, and then you can you don't have to quarantine. So with being defined as a close contact, that does not apply. If you are identified as a close contact of someone with COVID, you're automatically at a higher risk than uh, the traveler of than the category of travelers. So it's a different scenario, different rules, and that's part of what's very, very confusing about managing COVID is staying up on all of the rules. Um, and that's been part of our hurdle with helping people understand when we ask them to stay home for two weeks, 14 days, and sometimes longer. Sometimes they need to wait till the household index case is no longer infectious, and then their 14 days starts. So sometimes you're telling a child or a person they have to stay out of school or work for 20, 24 days. That's a long, long time. And it presents a lot of challenges to families, to businesses trying to get enough workers, to teachers trying to teach these kids and keep them with their lessons, um, schools. So it's, it's really a very, very big challenge. We knew it would be, um, but I think given this fall where it's our numbers are occurring in our younger population, it's been a particular challenge for us. Um, so we have a lot of people, our, our Thursday calls is really focusing on that. Our partners at Pathways, Open Door, Action, um, the mayor's team through Jill's office as well, or, trying to really mobilize and get as many resources out to families as we possibly can to assist them. Um, I talked about the schools a little bit and talked about what it means to be in the red zone. If you stay in the red zone for three consecutive weeks, the story changes a little bit. Um, you are required at that point to go from phase three, step two, back to step one. Um, for Gloucester, that doesn't have a huge impact on us or our businesses because it really only affects a very small number of businesses. Things like gyms have to revert from 50% capacity to 40. So again, it's significant to them, but it's not like a full closure. Um, museums and libraries, same things. We don't have a lot of the other industries that would be required to close down, like laser tags and those kinds of things. Um, and in terms of the gathering order, mainly it would go from 100 people to 50 people in an outdoor venue or a public space. So that is, those are the main changes that automatically do happen if you become a high-risk community for three consecutive weeks. Um, in terms of school and sports, again, it's one piece of the puzzle and it's something the school committee would have to revisit in conjunction with a lot of other data. What, what's happening over those three weeks? Are the numbers continuing to come down? Where are the cases? That sort of thing. 
Um, and so MIAA also has changed their rules that say even with one week of red, you don't need to stop sports. So none of our sports, none of our schools had to pivot to um, reducing or eliminating activities or changing their learning model. Um, after three or four weeks in the red, you know, I think there's probably a lot more discussion and a lot more data to look at. Um, but again, it would depend on where we're seeing those cases. So I hope that um, answers your question. I just want to also flag that there is some nice guidance on the city's website on Halloween and Halloween festivities. We have a, an event downtown this week. Um, so there's some good guidance guidelines to follow there. Thanksgiving guidelines will be coming on the heels of that. Some of you may have heard the governor today talking about the need to really restrict our holiday gatherings to smaller sizes. Um, we'll be doing some work on that as well locally to help people make some holiday plans um, in this tough time. So I wanted to give a shout out to our tracing team. And, and so you hear their names. I cannot say enough about the work of these people who are mostly nurses, some healthcare, um, and a couple of administrators who have scheduled, have rescheduled, have made sure our team gets paid, um, and who have taken calls all hours of the day, the night, the weekends, to try to stay on top of the situation in Gloucester and to support every single business or resident that needs something. And I don't think we've ever had to say to anybody, wait, you got to wait till Monday. I got to, you know, the best we can, someone is helping them and they go above and beyond. And when they're working with a family and there's a death or loss or something in that family, some of them write sympathy cards or ask the mayor to. Um, they advocate for grief counselors for their patients, um, food. They make extra calls, deliveries. They go above and beyond. And Gloucester would not be in the place it is without this team. Uh, so our administrator is Carol Mandello, who also works at the Visitor Center. She came to us um, over the summer and in the spring and keeps everybody on task and organized with, in conjunction with Carol McMahon. Our nurse team is Bridget Nelligan, Kim Cameron, Leora Ulrich, Diana Edgar Maloney, Eileen Matz, Sally Rich, Cindy Junker, Karen Huey, Cindy Johnson, Mary Haas, Jeff Parco, Callie Tilbert, Salam Mahdi, Vanessa Doucette from our dental center, and Sylvia Vanderberg and Kelly Highland. A particular shout out to Sylvia Vanderberg and Cindy Junker, along with Kelly before she went on maternity leave who have stepped up and led this team and trained new people and answered their questions and been available to us and the administration and many of you throughout this entire process, reminding us all the time of the human faces behind this outbreak and this disease. Um, and they tell me and they tell us every morning at 845 what they need what we need to do better, what I need to ask the mayor to go to the governor for. Um, and we, we, we do that and that's how it works. And um, so I just wanna say uh, we are very, very lucky to have them and I have learned from them and they are an absolute pleasure and uh, amazing group of professionals. So thank you for um, the time and I'm happy to answer questions anyone has um, or concerns. Thank you, Karen. Um, Councillor Pat, you had your hand up first, and then Councillor Cox. No, did not have my hand oh, up. I'm I sorry. think it was uh, Councillor Nimhart. I'm sorry, Councillor Hara did. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm not on it tonight. I'm God. <laughs> I'll snap out of it. Councillor Hara. Um, Jamie, you're on mute, pal. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for your efforts and thank you to your team for keeping the city safe. Uh, everyone appreciates it. A question, um, if you can get into a little bit more detail pertaining to how the wastewater um, reflects in, in the numbers as, as constituents have been inquiring. And also if, if that's localized or, or, or citywide. Um, 
the wastewater data is pulled from our treatment plant here in Gloucester. So it reflects Essex wastewater and then all of Gloucester that's on, on city, uh, city's wastewater. So people who have their own private septic systems are obviously not coming into that. Um, and it's a draw that's done automatically. It's a pump that pulls a sample once a week uh, and it's a 24 hour sample proportionate to act peak loads of activity. So it takes most of the sample at you know six in the morning, seven in the morning when people are getting ready for work, they're getting up, showering, all of that. Um, and then it also then draws the sample throughout the 24 hours with, you know, again, probably taking another larger percentage in the evening. So that's how they do it. It's done automatically by a, you know, some kind of pump that just pulls it. And then it gets sent off to the biobot labs that do the analysis. And they send us usually every Friday, sometimes Saturday, we get a report. Um, the only thing they measure is the virus, the wastewater virus particles, that's it. Um, anything above like 4,000, they can detect it. Below 4,000 particles, they can't, it's non-detectable. So um, we just, those first months we were, sometimes it was detected, sometimes it wasn't. Um, but we virtually had no cases through those first weeks in the summer. And um, the wastewater kind of reflected that. We were optimistic because we had many, many visitors, as you know, in Gloucester in August. So we were a little bit worried that, you know, what happens when all this beach wastewater and tourism and hotels, people coming from literally all over the country to visit Gloucester, we thought we might see more of a spike, but we did not. So again, you know, that was reassuring to us. Um, and then as this last outbreak happened, as I said, the virus in one week went from right at the level of detection to like seven times that, to, you know, 68,000 particles. Um, and so we could see that th that was happening. We, we had hoped that we might, you know, in the week prior, like it might give us an early warning, but I just don't think that there was enough um, people in this. I mean, 79 people is a lot, but compared to a population of 30,000, it's really not. It's a very small percentage. So we're not exactly sure why it was the jump was so fast, um, but you know I think that's kind of how the outbreak was. It was pretty quick, um, and people there were symptoms fast, and then testing fast, and um, so and then like I said last week, we saw it start to decline again. The wastewater numbers, um, and it just kind of it just reiterates what we think we know from our case numbers and from our 911 calls and from our prevalence and from all the other data, our hospitalizations. Um, and if they're in conflict, if we start to see that there's you know, a lot more virus, then we need to, we'll need to figure that out. You know, when we know that there's a lot of asymptomatic virus or transmission that could occur um, but we're just not seeing that. And so that is reassuring too, that we don't have massive amounts of virus in our community, or we would see it in our wastewater. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank Councilor you very much. Councilor O'Hara or, yeah. <clears throat> yes, and, and, th and thank you to Councilor Memhard for stepping on me. You're welcome to step on me anytime, Councilor Memhard. We welcome you and we thank you for returning to our meetings. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was I was going to ask the same question, Jamie, so I'm glad you brought it up. All right, uh, Councillor Cox. Thank you for the presentation and I apologize for being a little bit late. Um, we, I have a friend of mine that got tested um, up at stage four and he said that he has not received any notification yet. So he didn't have a way to contact them. There was no information given to the testees, I guess. Um, so if he hasn't heard now, by now, um, is there a way to contact them? Yeah, thank you, um, Councillor Cox. That's a good question. Um, as you know, the, sta the, the state runs the testing. So um, they, Fallon Ambulance runs the program and they email the results to people. 
um, but they were also have a result hotline you can call. And um, the first couple of days, they were not giving out the phone number. So the little piece of paper and, and also pe some people were getting the email and not knowing who it was from and, you know, or it would go to spam. So yeah, definitely. I, I, saw, I saw how it came across in the email. Um, a couple of my employees got tested. So I had to have that for employment records. But yeah, um, so go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it's a great point, and we definitely learned from that. Um, we then recreated a flyer for them that was given out in the, the, the last few days of testing. Joe Aiello made sure that it was distributed. He was coordinating, and uh, we put it up on Facebooks, and um, I will email you the information, so if your friend still hasn't found their result, but Vanessa's been also helping us distribute that information. Okay. Yeah. If anybody could get that to me, that would be great. And then I can just get sure. It. Of Thank course. You. Yeah. We'll get, we will get you that number, but it also is listed on the city's website for the weekly COVID update that we posted last week. So it okay. gives you, it gives you the phone number that you can call the hours that they're open and the email address that you should look for if you're going to get the email results and, and what you should expect. Cause there's a few access codes you have to register and then pre-register and then register your account to get your results. So it's a little complicated. So we tried to streamline it for people. Right. With my, when I got tested through CBS, um, there was only a like 24, 48 hour window that you had to get to register and everything. So he's worried that he might've missed that window to get his test results. So oh. if he has any problems, I, let us know and we'll help um, find the results. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other councilor questions? Uh, I think I saw Councilor Memhard, then Councilor Gilman, then Councilor Holmgren. Karen, thank you very, very much. It's really helpful to have your input and all the hard work by you and your team. You, you mentioned the uh, results of the first two days of the testing up at stage four. And I was curious if you had available for, to share with us the subsequent uh, four days or whatever it was of, of additional testing more recently. Yeah, we just got it this afternoon. I was really hoping I would have had a chance to to analyze it a little bit more. We did just get the testing information today from the last three days, um, and we can roughly see a couple of things. We maintain that five six hundred uh, people a day that we tested each day. Um, it felt quieter this last week, but I think maybe everybody got got good at it. So we did. I think uh, twenty. 800 people total in the five days. Um, so it's a lot of people they, they tested. And um, from first glimpse, our positivity rate has not gone up much from the original two days. I haven't calculated it yet, but it doesn't look like, it, it looks like roughly the same percentage of positives. So uh, under that Great. 2% or around that 2%. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Councilor Gilman. Sorry. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, always so um, wonderful to hear all the things that you're doing. Thanks. My question is, I'm intrigued to find out how we stay connected to the other Board of Health directors in Essex County. Uh, how is it that you kind of work collaboratively with them to find out what's happening in their communities mm -hmm. and how you bring that back to protecting us as well as you have been? Um, that's a great question. There's a lot of ways. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time on different calls and things. The state has uh, two calls a week for like administrative stuff. And then it has another two calls a week for local health on Just Maven. So we have a lot of calls with the state. Um, the rules and things are changing, the research changing. Uh, and so they go over that with health departments and we can ask questions, we can you know, share a little bit in that forum. Um, then we have a local health department meeting once a week where the North Shore health directors get together and we share ideas and we share everything from what's your Halloween flyer look like? How are you handling libraries? What are you doing about schools, um, sports? And it's fantastic because, you know, Middleton dealt with going red before we did. And so we learn from what other health directors are doing, what they're seeing, um, how it all plays out in communities, what kind of public messaging and outreach do you need to do? We share all of that. Um, 
and and then our actual health departments, the tracing team, when it comes to the cases, also communicates at a level through MAVEN on a patient information basis. So that's not something the health directors do, but the team I just mentioned, if there is a case in Gloucester who maybe works in Peabody or goes to school in, I don't know, you know, Beverly, then those two health departments, those public health nurses need to talk and do talk. And there's a way in MAVEN that you literally link the cases um, and you share just that information so that the full picture is understood between the two communities. So there's kind of a lot of levels in which we're talking and sharing information. Um, the health directors of the North Shore from day one have wanted to really stay consistent with each other as much as possible. Um, and now that the government ha governor has like these phases, it's easier. Did that answer your question? Thank you, Bill. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I, I don't have a question, but I again, I want to thank you for your patient and detailed explanation. And I especially want to say thank you for uh, naming the contact tracers. It just underscores the point that we are definitely all in this together and our, our friends and neighbors are the ones who are looking out for us. Uh, and uh, I I just want to personally thank them as well because I know that the work can be thank thankless. Uh, so their their dedication and compassion does not go unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Holmgren. Agreed. Thank you, Jen. Is there any other councilor questions? Councilor Pat. Just uh, not a question again. Just also to thank Karen and the entire team for all their work. Um, uh, for the many months and um, obviously thank you for naming uh, individuals but uh, also thank the uh, uh, administration um, for all of their work uh, together uh, on all of this and even uh, uh, down to our first responders and obviously uh, our DPW uh, uh, today we saw it with both uh, uh, water main and gas uh, main you know gas leaks and everything else so uh, I uh, just want to um, thank Karen and uh, everyone for, um, again, uh, keeping us all uh, in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, Jill, I see you pop your face on the screen. Would you like to add anything to this? Hi, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just wanted to, sorry, Karen, I know the days blur into each other. I just wanted to correct Karen, the business um, COVID update call is on Thursday morning at 9.30, not tomorrow. Uh, so it's on Thursday morning at 9.30. Invites went out from our economic development department, Discover Gloucester, as well as the chamber. Uh, it'll also, all the information will be available on our website as well. Um, and we're looking forward to it. We're partnering with the health department. They're really gonna walk people through what to do if an employee reports a positive COVID case and their resources. And then we're gonna go through some of the employee uh, resources available both for businesses as a result of the governor's new economic stimulus um, as well as employees. So um, please encourage people to join. It will have a restaurant and service focus, but the beginning will really be that what to do if you get a positive. So any business is welcome to join um, Thursday morning at 930 and the information will be on our website tomorrow morning. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, anything else from the counselors? All right, seeing none, I just want to thank Karen. Um, not only Karen for doing such a great job, but Vanessa and Safat and, our, and the mayor, take me off, uh, mayor, I'm gonna call you Safat here because that's what I call you. Um, for doing such a great job, Vanessa and the mayor, both reaching out to the council, um, the mayor on social media and just, you know, with everything that Karen, you're giving them, they're pumping the information out to us and pumping it out to the community as fast as they're getting it. And I think everybody's doing an amazing job. So um, kudos to everybody that's part of this team. So great job, everybody. Hopefully the numbers go down. We can get back to normal eventually. Hopefully, I don't know, this is just like every day it seems gloomier and gloomier, but whatever. It is what it is at this point. Um, you have to take care of yourself first. And that's where it starts. Wear a mask, wash your hands, right? Don't forget time change is Sunday. So yeah. it'll be brighter after that Yay. a little bit, right? Every day. 
All the that helps. I, I get up early in the morning, so it doesn't do me any good. It's just going to be darker and earlier when I get up. So, but anyway, uh, Karen, thank you. I appreciate that. We're going to wrap up. The thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, next order of business, please. Next order of business is the consent agenda. All right. Is there any counselors that would like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Uh, I saw Councillor Cox's hand up, but I don't see her anymore. Oh, there she is now. Councillor Gilman. Thank you, Councillor. I'd like to remove under approval of minutes from previous council and standing committee meetings, the city council meeting of October 13th, 2020, as well as understanding committee meetings, P and D minutes of October 21st, 2020. Is there anybody else that would like to remove anything else? All right, seeing none, Councilor Gilman. On the city council meeting of October 13th, 2020, I wanted to just clarify publicly that some of our amendments to amendments were unclear in the minutes. However, the discussion was spot on and the final vote that we made for Atlantic Road was eight in favor, zero opposed, and one abstained, which was Council Memard, who was not there. So I wanted to be clear that um, although the amendments were not clear, the final vote was very clear, as was the discussion. Um, I also wanted to um, mention that under the P&D minutes, draft minutes of October 21st, 2020, there was a small Scribner's error where it was mentioned that um, at 5.33, there was a quorum of the city council at 5.33. And there were no other members of the city council that were there other than the three of us on that subcommittee. So um, I, I move that we- I'll, I'll, do, I'll, take, I'll take care of it. I'll okay, it. great. Thank you. All right. All right. So seeing that there's nothing else, um, I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda as amended. So sure. move. Second. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take I heard Councilor Memhard was moved by Councilor Memhard. And who seconded it? Councilor Holmgren. All right. I, I I'm just trying to get some <laughs> some of these details in because um, we're gonna start doing this. A little more often so it's, it's hard to um so that way when they go into the minutes we know who's moving and who's seconding so we'll do on that one council mem hard moved it council Holmgren seconded it all right all in favor we're going to do a roll call vote call vote council mccarthy yes council of mem hard yes council of nolan is absent council o'hara yes council of pet yes council of cox yes council of gilman Yes. Council Holmgren? Yes. Council Blank? Yes. Motion passes to accept the amended consent agenda. Um, eight in favor, one absent. All right. Great job, everyone. Madam Clerk, we have the next order of business, please. Okay. So, do you have a motion to amend the uh, PD minutes by striking that? Did you want to do that, Val? Were you going to pull it? I think we did them all. We did them both oh. at the same time. Okay. Right. Because I thought she pulled it off and that would be voted separately. Is okay. that not correct? Well, I, I, I thought that when we amend the minutes, she, she did both um, amendments at the same time. We just voted. Okay. But All right. Fine. We can we can do it separately. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll do the uh, amendment to the P&D minutes separately. So that way we're covering ourselves. So we'll do the roll call vote. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Memhard? Yes. Council Nolan is absent. Council O'Hara? Yes, yes. Council Pat? Yes. Council Cox? Yes. Council Gilman? Yes. Council Holmgren? Yes. And Council Blank? Yes. Motion to approve the minutes, uh, to amend the minutes. Passes on a roll call vote of eight in favor, one absent. All right, just to be safe. Madam Clerk, next order of business, please. It's the Budget and Finance Standing Committee report of October 22nd. 
Councilor Cox. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a consent agenda um, that I put forward that covered all the material from the last meeting. If anybody would like to pull anything, please do so now. Seeing no objections, I move the consent agenda. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Moved by Councilor Cox, seconded by Councilor McCarthy. I'll call the roll call vote. Council McCarthy, um, I'm sorry, it's been seconded Council by Councilor Memhard. A little, little flustered today. Um, Council McCarthy. The gas yes. leak's not at your house? <laughs> Councilor Memhard. Yes. Councilor, no one is absent. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councilor Cox. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Holmgren. Yes. Council LeBlanc, yes. Motion to accept the consent agenda for the budget and finance passes on a roll call vote. Eight in favor, one absent. All right, Madam um, Clark. I, if I could for one second, Go Councilor LeBlanc. Yep. Um, I just want to have a big shout out to our city auditor and our city CFO on the award that we got from the government finance office Officers Association. Um, this is the third year running that we've received this award. So I really do appreciate the staff that we have on the budget and finance team um, and really appreciate them and for going this extra mile for the award. So three years running. Thank you, Councillor. And on that note, um, while we're talking about that, Council, um, Kenny had given me a call earlier this afternoon asking for a photo op. So if everybody feels comfortable gathering at the auditorium, maybe we can get together, hold our breath for 30 seconds, take a picture, or we can try to social distance to a certain extent, or he would like some headshots. So I'll have a quick discussion on that, Council Holmgren. Maybe we can find somebody with a drone. <laughs> there you go. And like um, fly so it from the ceiling, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to, okay. we'll have to get something together. Um, but we'll have this discussion. I'll send out a quick email blast later on and uh, we can figure out how we want to do it. So we have a little bit of time to think about it. All right. Great all job. Jason Groves, put yourself all on the steps like he did with us. There Be proactive. Yep, that's put a, a mask idea. on and then just slightly go like this and take it off or whatever. Yeah. But yes. That's a good or idea. Or else I can, take, I can take a shot of you all right now. Let me see your smiles. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Uh, I thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We appreciate that. And uh, kudos to John and kudos to Kenny for an excellent job. And yeah, kudos. and hopefully Absolutely. we can, once that photo op or whatever is done, uh, as I had uh, responded, uh, I hope we can get this out to the, the public in general, not just those that are, you know, watching a city council meeting or anything else to understand how great a job, um, you know, we are uh, in the hands of these uh, financial um um, people, um, Pro professionals. Had, uh, yeah. professionals is, is, is an understatement. I just didn't want to use that word. I didn't want them looking for a pay raise already. <laughs> All right. Awesome job. A great, great job, um, everyone. Kudos. Councilor Blank, just real quick. Um, as you guys all know, I'm dealing with a gas uh, leak at my house. So if I turn my camera off, it means that I had to step outside and talk to national grid because they're actively digging up my house. Okay. Um, so I, I apologize for the in and out. I wanted to be here for the budget and finance part in the discussion for the presentation. Love going by my house. Um, okay. But I'm pretty sure you guys can handle the rest of it without me, but I'm going to try to stay on as much as I can. But um, I just got called to go downstairs. So again, if my camera's off, please skip me on a roll call. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Melissa. Thank you. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, next order of business, please. Uh, the next order of business, um, the uh, ordinance and administration did not meet on October 19th. So it would be the Planning and Development Committee report of October 21st. Yes, I have no matters to report except for I just wanted to remind counselors that we have a site visit this Thursday, the 29th of October at 37 Rocky Neck Ave on a special council permit. At 4.45, I'm hoping the counselors attend. And at 5.15, um, abutters are being notified or have been notified. Um, so I just would like to hear from all of you. Doesn't have to be right now, um, but let me know what session you plan on being there. I know Council McCarthy is going to be there at 4.45, as well as P&D. I think Council Memhard uh, 
Um, so if any of the rest of you decide that you want to come, um, please let me know if you're going to be at 445 or 515. And okay. like we have been doing in the past, we'll be doing social distance um, site visits. We'll also be having hand sanitizer there. We'll have masks if someone shows up without one. And I will be the scribe to all the questions that come up from anyone. Um, so we will ask the applicant, who in this case is Joel Favaza, attorney of Favaza, um, to answer all those questions when we get back at P&D on November, I think it's 10th, right? Um, is it 10th? Um, maybe it's, am I wrong? It um, is the... Well, well, the election uh, day is the third. It's got to be the eleventh, right? No, uh, the city no, no, council. It's, it's, so it's 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 November fourth. Yes. November fourth. Yeah. yeah. Right. Great. Thank you. And then we can all respond to Council Gillen's email to schedule. Um, so I just wanted to announce too that um, there's not going to be an old, old ordinance and administration meeting on November second because of the election. Um, we decided to continue all the matters on the consent agenda will be taken up on November 16th meeting just for, uh, for, for public information. Um, that way Joanne doesn't have to, our city clerk doesn't have to juggle the meeting and get ready for the election, the huge election that she's going to take part of on, on uh, the third. So. There's an election? Yeah. Um, 2020, baby. Crazy. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, we have the next order of business, please. <laughs> Next order of business is public hearing 2020-010, Special City Council Permit 2020-002, Essex Avenue, number 99, map 216, lot 126, Foster Zoning Ordinance, section 3.1.6B, building heights in excess of 35 feet, section 2.3.4, parentheses 13, marine-related service storage or, or repair, limited primarily primarily in the MI district to commercial fishing vessels and section 5.5 low end requirements, five, section 5.5.2 and section 5.5.3 in the EB district. Alrighty, so I'm gonna open the public hearing and continue it till November 10th, 2020. Um, and then after that, we'll get a better grasp on with uh, planning and development will, when it will be coming to uh, the public hearing part of it. So we'll have a better grasp of continuing it out at this moment. We're just going to continue it until it gets to planning and development. So um, next order of business, Madam Clerk. Public hearing 2020-029 to amend the Gloucester Code of Ordinances, Chapter 8, Fire Prevention and Protection, Article 2, Section 21, Qualifications and Appointment of Firefighters, Subsection D, Regarding Training and Certification Requirements. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm going to open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that would like to speak in favor. Chief Smith. Yes, sir. Good evening, Council. Um, we have put this forward uh, with the assistance of our legal department to uh, kind of revise this language and, and update it to really what should be current practice um, in the face of, of where things stand and, and economic reasons, it, uh, it makes no sense to force uh, some of the new firefighters that we have coming on board now uh, come with all the training that the Department of Fire Service Mass Fire Academy provides uh, in the fire academy as it's cited uh, in our ordinance. And in our ordinance, it, it gives no latitude um, or understanding that, hey, if they walk in the door with this training, there, there's no need to send them. And so you're talking a, a 10 week program of which, you know, they're employees for us, they're making a long drive, you know, out and back to Stowe every day, Monday through Friday, some Saturdays included, um, you know, just risk management says it's a bad idea to have people doing that kind of driving on the highway for no reason uh, to go obtain something that they already have. Um, not to mention that these are, this is a limited commodity, the number of seats that the academy has. Um, I, I wish really that the state would be more proactive in this and state uh, and change their rules and say, hey, we're not going to admit you to the program if you already have these credentials. But uh, they haven't made that step yet. There's a lot of departments and cities that have the same language issue in either 
bargaining agreements with their fire department or in ordinances like we do. So uh, we're taking a proactive step to change it. I've got two personnel on board right now uh, that have started and are working and they're fully trained and there's no need to send them to the academy. They, they came with everything they needed and then some uh, and to send them away for 10 weeks uh, to redo it is, is foolish at best and, and wasteful at the far end of it. So we're hoping that uh, you agree and that looking at this language, uh, it looks satisfactory to me, to the legal department. We're hoping you guys agree and uh, we're looking for this to get adopted. And uh, that's really it. And if you have any questions, I'll, I can answer those for you now. Okay, hold on a second, Chief. We're gonna get through the public hearing part of it first. We'll get to counselor questions shortly. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, are there any communications? There are none. All right, now it's time for counselor questions. Do we have any counselor questions? No, nope. looks pretty straightforward to me also. All right, so I'm gonna close the public hearing and I will call for the committee report. Uh, on a motion by Councilor Nolan, seconded by Council O'Hara, the Ordinance Administration Committee by roll call, three in favor, zero opposed to recommend that the City Council um, the city council and the, the Boston Code of Ordinances, Chapter 8, Article 2, Section 21, Qualifications and Appointment of Firefighters, Subsection D, be amended as follows. Subsection D, all newly hired city firefighters shall either attend and successfully complete the recruit training program at the State Firefighting Academy with satisfactory completion of the recruit training program or submit satisfactory documentation that the newly hired firefighter has completed in a an equivalent training program with the same certification as the State Firefighter Academy as be a condition of employment. Completion of the program shall be whenever as possible with the employee's prohibitionary period prescribed by Mass General Law, Chapter 31, Section 61. If a firefighter begins the recruit training program during the prohibitionary period, the prohibitionary period shall be suspended until the firefighter completes the program. The provisionary period would expire prior to the firefighters entering the academy. The mayor will make a written request to the personnel administrator for extended the provisionary period until the program is completed. And I so move. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Council. Um, it's been mo motion by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Council O'Hara. Uh, is there any other discussion, Councilors? Councilor Holmgren? This just seems like a slam dunk. It is fiscally prudent. It, um, it shaves time off of uh, everybody's busy schedules. Uh, thank you, Chief Smith, for being proactive. I'm definitely voting in favor. Thank you. Councilor Pat. Yeah, I um, uh, also wanna thank uh, uh, the Chief for um, getting this uh, straightened away administratively. Uh, I've had the uh, privilege of being able to uh, attend uh, um, a firefighting academy uh, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of times uh, over the years. And uh, it's a great asset uh, for all the communities. And uh, I'm happy that we're able to uh, be proactive and uh, uh, get this part uh, um, on the books and able to get uh, firefighters um, here in town uh, doing their thing without having to uh, traits back and forth to stow uh, unnecessarily. You're muted, Steve. I'm on mute. All right. Uh, thank you, Barry. Is there anybody else? Council McCarthy. Um, just basically, it, it great move by Chief Smith. Uh, it gets our firefighters in the uh, fire stations and in working uh, ten weeks sooner, um, so that they. Uh, can help out the city. So great move. All right. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to call for the roll call. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Memhard. Yes. Councilor Nolan is absent. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councilor Cox. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Holmgren. Yes. And Council of LeBlanc, yes. Motion passes on a roll call vote with eight in favor, one absent. All right, great job. Thank you, everyone. Council. Thank you, Chief. We appreciate it. Always uh, 
always doing the right thing and making sure you're up to date on everything. So good job to you. Appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, so before we get to the mayor request to the mayor, uh, I sent out a quick email today on some of the things that we should be thinking about in the future. Uh, last week, I, I mean, I know it's not on the agenda, but this is something that I think we need to discuss about uh, remote participation. Last week, we had um, John and, and Barry glitch out for a minute here and there. So we should kind of have some rules to follow that if I drop out or if Val drops out, who's the next in line? How do we do it? If we have a quorum, if we don't have a quorum, um, if Joanne drops out, uh, you know, if we have a power outage, how are we going to do this? So I sent out a quick um, email earlier to, to kind of, let me see if I can share my screen. All right. Remember your last your last comment. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we are. We, we will be kind of messed up if Joanne. All right. So these are kind of the kind of the things that um, we need to take a look at. So I, you know, this is just kind of something I threw together. I think we should send this out to O and A to really take a good look at this to bring it back up to the council to take a look at it. Um, you know. If um, Joanne, if, 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 if I drop out, obviously Val runs the meeting. If I drop out and Val drops out, then I think it would be the chair of either BNF, ONA, or PD will continue. And then so on, it'll be the vice chair, as long as there's a quorum. If we have multiple cons counselors drop out, then I think that um, you know we'll continue as long as there's a quorum. And if there is no quorum, we can wait, we can pause for a few minutes to see if they'll get back on. And then if, they, if we don't have a quorum, we'll have to suspend our meeting. And if Joanne will, drops out, then we're kind of, we're in kind of up the creek. You're allowed to paddle, you know? Also, I have a procedural question on that. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Joanne, if there is a co-host, is it still recording? It should be. As long as I make a, a co-host, the co-host can start the meeting because uh, you have started the BNF meeting without me starting it. So as yeah. long as someone is a co-host, um, they can start the meeting and they can stop the meeting. Okay. That was my bigger question that yeah. if That's Joanne no. dropped, yeah, I yeah, think. That's good. Yeah, because she promotes okay. me to a co-host. So some. So we may, we may want to... Um, Figure, figure this out. So I, I think this is a good enough, I'll, I'll put the Council Holmgren. Uh, sorry, yes, thank you very much, Mr. President. I was wondering if we should amend our rules of procedure to reflect this uh, during yeah. the pandemic. And just well, clean that's, them up. I, that's why I think I'll, I'll put the order in tomorrow. So okay. it'll, it'll get referred out to ONA. Um, I do think this is a little bit of heavy lifting and we should have this in place because God forbid, like right now, if I dropped out, well, say, say we had a power outage in West Gloucester. That would be you, that would be Sean, and that would be right. Jamie, mm -hmm. you know? So, and that's a power outage. We don't know what's a power outage. You guys can't get back on. If we have one right. downtown, that'll be Melissa, myself, and Barry, you know? So there's, there's, there's certain things that can go wrong during these meetings, and we should have protocol to follow these rules because right now, if, if I drop out, Val drops out, Melissa drops out, everybody's kind of sitting around twiddling the thumbs going, all right, what do we ne do next? Um, we need to keep we need to keep the meeting going as long as there's a quorum, you yep. know? Um, so, all right. So we'll bump this out to ONA for discussion. We'll bring it back to council. Um, and then I think that, you know, during the ONA meeting, we should all kind of bring our heads together and, and get this right. And so that we can bring it up to council. As long as we announce that we have a quorum with the city council, we can kind of get this. Um, I think it's just best practices. So that way, God forbid something happens. We we know and the public knows these are the rules that we need to go by. So this Thanks, is just something I, I just thought about Council over the weekend. Council Cox. Um can we've never done anything like this before, but um usually during the consent agenda, you know, things get referred out to ONA. I'd like to make a motion to go ahead and move this 
to ONA so you guys can take it up at your next meeting instead of waiting two more weeks for you to put an order in. And that way everybody could take what you started here, maybe correct the grammar. Um, I just put that on there for us. <laughs> we are screwed. If Joanne drops out, we are screwed. That's the, you know. No, it's the word that I was talking about, not the, yeah. the screwed. But um, <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, that way we don't lose two weeks on this because with the impending snowstorm Thursday and Friday, you know, we are really starting to get in the thick of it quite quickly. So yeah, well, uh, our next meeting is until November 16th anyway. Winter. So we, we still have a couple of weeks. Yeah, our okay. next meeting is not, we got, we're, uh, we're not going to do the October 2nd meeting because it's the election night. So we do right. have a couple of weeks, but yeah, but that's fine. We can, but we can, can I go ahead and make a motion to, yeah, um, go for it, to send it to ONA? Sure. I'll second. second. All right. So motion to move by Councilor Cox and seconded by Councilor Memhard. Okay. All right. So, so everybody understands what we're trying to do here. We're just trying to be more efficient in the, our meetings if something goes wrong. All right, so I'll call for the roll call. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Memhard. Yes. Council O'Hara. Yes. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councilor Cox. Yes. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Council Holmgren. Am I voting yes on the amendment that Councilor Cox made that I, the motion rather, and I just yeah, got the, kicked out? The, uh, yeah, there's no amendment, it's just a motion to get it. It's right, just so a motion. Yes. How about speak of the devil? Yes. 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 All right. Council of Blank, yes. So this will get bumped out to ONA. So we'll put this on the next ONA agenda. All right. That's good. At least we got to start to everything, guys. And this is this is a good thing. Because um, who knows how long we're going to be in this for? Who, know, who knows when the next pandemic is going to come? At least we're going to set the next council up or the future council up for some of these unprecedented rules of procedure <laughs> i believe the term is new normal <laughs> new normal hey steve maybe maybe <laughs> yeah. even ask will you on meeting ask chip to weigh in i mean losing a quorum is addressed in roberts but not <laughs> not with the uh, zoom so right yeah we'll have to we'll have to beat that up a little bit as long as we're not voting if we lose a we'll, we'll figure it out in no one but yeah i agree okay all right yeah. thank you everybody for that for uh, your input and uh, we're looking forward to some some of, um, Thank you for requests. bringing it forward. I mean, it's something that we need to think about, and I, I appreciate your um, foresight on that. Appreciate it too. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Next order of business, please. Next order of business is the uh, request to the mayor. All right. So I'm going to go from left to right on my screen in no particular order. Barry's up first. So any requests to the mayor, Barry? No. Nope. All right. Myself is next. I have nothing. Councilor Gilman. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have a few. Okay. Um, request to the mayor that the Conservation Commission agent recommend a remediation plan to remove the Fragmite invasives, invasives at Lanes Cove. Um, with city oversight, a group of Lanesville volunteers are eager, eager to work with Conservation Commission or Public Works to help remove. And it was noted that Senator Tarr has helped organize similar invasive removal at salt marshes in Newburyport. Second, um, a second request that Public Works installs an additional do not enter sign to be placed on the left side of High Street at the intersection of Hickory and High Street. Third, request that the city petition the state to place a guardrail in front of 695 Washington Street, the scene of more than three serious accidents, including a recent accident where a car tire went through the residence window at 695 Washington Street. Finally, at the same location, seek input from the Gloucester Police Department based on accident frequency at the site that public works swap the 30 mile an hour sign, which is placed at this dangerous corner with a slow dangerous corner sign and move the 30 mile an hour sign up to be at the current spot where the slow dangerous corner sign is located. Thank you. All right, Council Memhard, thank you, Val. I would just like to thank the mayor for all that she and her administration are doing and keep, keep, keep on the good work. Thank you, Scott. How are you feeling? You're back to normal? The new normal. Attaboy. <laughs> Councilor McCarthy. Nothing tonight. Thank you. 
Thanks, John. Council Cox. Um, yeah. <laughs> so with the road work that's being done over here, and I'm not talking about my current activity, which is also interesting. Um, National Grid has stopped working on the project. So I reached out to Mike Hale earlier this week to ask him to consolidate the equipment in the Burnham's Field parking lot because um, we have winter coming and we need to be able to use as much of that space for street off street parking as possible. Um, so he said he was gonna do that and also take out the uh, porta potty that was there. Um, because it had been used for um, bad activity for a while and a neighbor caught it on video. So I just want to make it official that I'm now putting that request in. Um, I need, really needed Mike to act quick on the porta potty thing, so I just reached out to him directly. Um, in addition to that, the bump outs that have been placed in my neighborhood uh, now require a lot of no parking from here to corner signs. Um, so uh, Barry, I understand you are the Ward 2 city councilor, but I am living and breathing this um, and it needs to be done rather quickly. Um, so I'm happy to loop you in. It's hard to do a meeting in the area because of our situation. Um, and I think it requires a walkthrough. Uh, the yeah, well, let me just, um, you know, interrupt there. Um, the 20 feet of the in, uh, no parking within 20 feet of an intersection is by statute. So it's, it, it, it doesn't have to be a, you know, go through the traffic commission or anything else. Uh, a simple request to either to the mayor or uh, the signs uh, and poles are on order. Uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. They, they can go ahead uh, uh, and, you know, through to the DPW or whatever, and they can be installed. There's no uh, there's no uh, process, and if you have a whole list, I'm more than happy to just have you, you know, uh, forward them. I do realize that 20 feet from an intersection part of it, like, been doing this job for a bit now, um, but it's more than that. It is, I mean, there is a lot of changes happening over here, and there's a lot of pushback with restricting parking. Um, we have been living with it for a few months now, and I can tell you exactly where the pinch, pinch points are. Good God, Steve. Um, and these are not necessarily on a corner. So um, when you're coming okay, down yeah. uh, Millet and you wanna go back up Sergeant, you have to go pretty wide. And if there's another car coming, um, it, it it's not on a corner technically with these bump outs. So, I'm happy to walk you through it if you wanted to do it, or I'd, I can just yeah, be happy to ha be happy to meet uh, with you, and maybe okay. we could have uh, uh, through the mayor we could have the DPW director, you know, uh, join us. And for that matter, we could have a representative uh, of both uh, uh, the police and the fire department. Uh, if there's a problem of someone, you know, making a corner, maybe we need to look at is can fire apparatus get through, etc. Um, you know, anything yeah. to be corrected. So. We can set up a meeting to walk through with everybody involved and uh, address the done. issue. To the chair, the polls and the signs have been ordered. Um, Council yeah. Cox did relay that message. I understand too, there's one that's really dangerous. If we don't put a sign, nothing's gonna go through is the corner of the Pleasant Street before Shepherd Street to the other side of Pleasant Street, that whole corner. Now, everyone knows you can't park to hit a corner. Unless they see a sign, they forget. It's been years, there's been nothing there, we've allowed it. When you allow one, then they'll say, well, there was never no sign, I don't know. And it's our fault because first of all, we never did enforcement, so we will. Um, Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Val, please forward me all your concerns because and requests because there's no way in hell I'm going to remember them. But the signs on the corners of the bumpers, I can. So yes, they are in order because I asked for that from day one when Melissa Cox already um, suggested <laughs> a month ago. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. So yeah, it's just it's it's a little crazy over here right now. And then the old crosswalks are still in place, but we're not going to pave until National Grid's done. So like, there's just a whole host of issues and people are now parking in crosswalks, old crosswalks. So I, you know, and to be fair to the police department, I can't really call anything in because there are no signs and we're waiting for them. But, um, but out of respect of 
Counselor Pet's position. Um, I just want to try to loop them in as much as possible. So thank you, everybody. Just keep a running note of everything so that way we, when it comes around to it, we'll get we'll get to it. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Anything thank else now? Nope. Yeah, Melissa, email me or whatever. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, Council Holmgren. I want to thank the city clerk's office and all of the volunteers who've come in uh, over these past days to help with uh, the early election, early voting. Um, amazing work on, on, on behalf of, uh, I'm sure everybody here uh, and the city, thank you and uh, good luck on the third. We all appreciate it and have a very safe and happy Halloween, everybody. Thank you, John. Council O'Hara. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll be having at the Magnolia Library, we'll be having a blood drive tomorrow uh, from two to seven. I want to thank Councillor Cox, who has uh, already volunteered to roll up her sleeve. Um, it's it's almost full, but you can call 1-800-RED-CROSS for an appointment. And if not, there'll be another collection on November 9th. And I want to extend, uh, as Council Holgren just said, a sincere Thank you and best of luck to uh, the city clerk with Tuesday's election. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I'm gonna go on my app right now, see if I can get on there. Um, all right, is there anything else before we break the meeting up? Seeing nothing, I'm gonna call for, I'm gonna entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. second. So moved and seconded. Um, Moved by Councillor Pett, seconded by Councillor Cox. Yes. Uh, Councillor McCarthy? Yes. Councillor Memard? Yes. There you go. Councillor Hara? Yes. Councillor Pett? Yes. Councillor Cox? Yes. Councillor Gilman? Yes. Councillor Holmgren? Yes. And Councillor LeBlanc? Yes. All right. Great job, everyone. Good night. Stay safe, and we'll see you uh, next week.